Well, hey there. Uh, Welcome to Cornerstone Community Church's Sunday morning gathering on Monday morning. Uh, Some knucklehead forgot to turn on the microphone before the message yesterday, so all you got was video, no audio, so we're taking care of that this morning. And uh, whether it's this morning or this afternoon or this evening and whatever time you access this, we're, we're grateful to be together with you and to trust that this message will find its way to your heart. Uh, and that God will have his way as only he can. The title of the message is that Christ came to free us from the futility of trying to free ourselves from ourselves and our sin. It's pretty obvious that that's a losing game as soon as you start to play it. We can't uh, free ourselves from ourselves, we can't save ourselves from ourselves, and we can't free ourselves or forgive us even for our own sin by ourselves. The subtitle of this message is Our Best Efforts to Keep the Law. And this is from Galatians chapter 5. Our Best Efforts to Keep the Law. Prove all we can do is keep breaking it. <laughs> That's how it goes down. So it was yesterday morning as I was typing the note I always do and on Sunday morning inviting people to join us online. Uh, I wrote this. Today's message is Christ came to free us from the futility of trying to free ourselves from ourselves and our sin. I already said that. It comes from Galatians chapter 5. I already said that. Here's what I hadn't said yet. Only he can free us because only he never sinned. He's the only one qualified. Only he can free us because only he never sinned. That remark reminds me of this. If you ever find yourself in quicksand you will have found yourself in a perfect illustration of today's message. Of course, if you're in the quicksand, you probably aren't thinking about a sermon illustration. Uh, Of course, you still need to get out of that quicksand before it's too late, but it's a great illustration. It really is. The, The only way someone stuck in quicksand... Uh, and it's definitely a life-threatening reality to be stuck in the quicksand. The only way that person can be saved is if someone who's not currently in the quicksand with them comes to them without getting into the quicksand and pulls them out. That's the only way that somebody in quicksand is going to survive. And uh, again, only someone not in the quicksand can rescue someone who's in the quicksand. And what a picture of a sinless Savior coming to save us from our sin. He, he's never been in it. He's never struggled with it in the sense of having given in to it. He was tempted, but he never gave in. And so he's the one qualified to forgive us, to free us, to cleanse us, to bring us to our Father, to bring us into God's family. Only, only he can do that. And again, this message is from Galatians chapter 5. The theme of it is this. What we could never do concerning the law and the flesh has been beautifully, completely, powerfully, lovingly, and freely done for us in Christ. And the application is know, believe, and embrace. And all three have to happen. You can't embrace until you really believe. You can't really believe until you really know. Know, believe, and embrace what God says about our freedom in Christ. Here's the focus. Someday somebody is going to read the Bible and believe it, and we're all going to be embarrassed. You may have heard me say that once or a hundred times, or maybe closer to a million, maybe not. Uh, You may have heard that before. I hope the heart of what it conveys, someday somebody's going to read the Bible and believe it, and we're all going to be embarrassed, that the heart of what that conveys continues to rattle any cages that you or I are still in when it comes to what the Bible actually says and what the Bible actually means. One of the delights, I'm sorry, one of the great themes of the great story of God is the, uh, and those he created in his image, is that he delights to set free anyone imprisoned in any way whatsoever. It's it's important to understand that whoever, whenever, uh, whatever, wherever, God is able He's able to accomplish what concerns us today, whatever it may be, because he's God, and he's God all by himself. Today's message comes from perhaps the clearest chapter on this very thing. God tells us that in the final analysis, all the law was able to do was expose us as the lawbreakers that we are. 
And that's a good thing because it positions us to look to the one who fulfills the law and invites us to stand on his merit through our faith in him. The, 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 the Ten Commandments, the moral laws, the civil laws, all the Mosaic laws, uh, all, all those laws do is expose the fact that our broken lives and our fallen uh, bodies uh, our propensity to now that we know the knowledge of good and evil is to check out evil that that when God tells us what to do and what not to do and then again all the ceremonial laws and the mosaic laws all those laws do is ultimately show us that we can never do this we can never do this completely we can never do this perfectly we can give it our best shot but in the end we cannot free ourselves from ourselves or our sin or our propensity to do what is wrong it's everybody's struggle. And so this chapter in Galatians chapter 5, it's so liberating. <laughs> Get it? It really is liberating because it brings truth about true liberation. And I'll just read the first 12 verses. That's what we're going to look at first. Uh, the, the, the first point of this message is that the freedom we have in Christ is the result of Christ having his way in us. And underneath it, it says, and we're going to hear this verse, what part of it is for freedom that Christ has set us free don't we get? Listen to these first 12 verses in Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And you can tell Paul's a little, a little heated here, a little, a little ticked actually, as, as you'll hear. Mark my words. He's throwing it down. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. No value of you to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Say that again. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole bunch of the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still pre preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And he actually says this. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Yeah, he just said that. Again, the first point is the freedom we have in Christ is the result of Christ having his way in us. Uh, freedom, here's something to acknowledge, that freedom cannot be experienced unless there's someone or something from whom or from which we need to be released. Think about that. You, we, we, we wouldn't experience what freedom is if we didn't know what being locked up was. And, and uh, you know... Uh, or, or another way to, to, to make the point is how can, how can you experience the difference between hot and cold if there is no hot or cold or if you've never experienced hot or cold? How, how will you ever know? And, of course, there is hot and there is cold, and we've, both experience, we've all experienced both. And there is this reality of needing to be free. And the big three from which we need to be free are from Satan, our sin, and ourselves. All three are very real enemies. And sometimes our biggest enemy is the man or woman in the mirror. That's for sure. So uh, we can't make ourselves right with God any more than we can truly live a totally righteous life. You will die trying to make yourself right with God if it's you trying to make that happen because it can't happen. Only God can free us from the prison we're in in that the the the, uh, the reality of laws being given and us breaking them is a constant throughout human history. That the, there are rights, there are wrongs, there are truths, there are lies, and God helps us to know 
you know, that there are and which is which. And so that's why this is so important to understand that we need freedom. And that very first verse is the foundation upon which the whole chapter stands. The whole chapter, you know, rests, however you want to say it, is built upon. Listen to the words again. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And be sure to catch the verb tense. It doesn't say it is for freedom that Christ will set us free. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Past tense occurrence, present tense reality. He did that. He did that. When he said it is finished, it was finished on the cross. All the work he came to accomplish, uh, he, he did it. And he did it for us. And, he, and his desire clearly is to deeply do it in us and through us so that we will, we will experience who he came to be and what he came to do and what he came to give, that we will know that personally, actually, intensely. And, and so, and so uh, the, the knowing we can't make ourselves right with God any more than we can live a totally righteous life, we do need to grab on to the beginning of this chapter. Again, we're set free to be free. It sounds redundant, but it makes the point that that's, that's what this is all about. Um, and again, it doesn't say... He will set us free. It says he has set us free. And then it's followed by these two imperatives. Stand firm. Those are the, the first words after he set us free, has set us free. Stand firm. That's one. And do not. So stand firm and then do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Why would you go back to that which, which kept you locked up? Why would you go back to trying to earn what God has already paid for, paid for in full, to earn what he's offering you for free, to try to work for what he wants to be a gift. It, it, it's, it's futile. And again, back to the title of the message, Christ came to free us from the futility of trying to free ourselves from ourselves and our sin. And then as this passage continues, I said before, that, that, that second verse when Paul says, mark my words, in so many words he's saying, Listen up. This is important and you need to get this. Mark my words. I, Paul, that's what he says. This is, this is that important to him. Um, the, 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 and it's a scathing rebuke throughout this whole uh, passage. Scathing. And it, and it ends, again, with some pretty profound sarcasm to make a point. Uh, he he, sound, he sounds ticked off because he is ticked off. He is, he is agitated about these agitators who are agitating these people. He, he is ignited with a, a, a flaming concern for, for their well-being and for, and for them to be corrected where they need to be corrected. So, again, he, he's saying in so many words at the beginning there... I, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you think you're going to get right by doing this one thing on your own, then you just keep going and try to do everything on your own. You'll discover it's not going to work. And now he's saying circumcision is no longer a necessity. Jesus was an observant Jew. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day when he went to the temple. Uh, circumcision was an identification for those as God's people. But now that and Paul's writing this, you know, post Life of Christ, post-death, post-burial, post-resurrection, post-ascension. Paul's writing this to say circumcision is no longer an issue. In fact, all of these uh, civil and ceremonial laws, uh, you know, mixed clothing and all that stuff, for, forget about it. Not, not in the sense of forget about it and totally that we're, because the, they were given to distinguish us as God's people back in the Old Testament from the outside in. Now it's an inside out that this happens. And so Paul is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. it. It is no longer necessary to make yourself right with God because he makes, your, he makes us right with himself now through Christ. When Christ came, that changed everything. He's a fulfillment of law. He himself said, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. His whole life was lived uh, in, in a lawful way, as it were. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. And, and that's part of why we can trust him. But clearly, he's saying here, uh, and look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, 
let these words uh, you know, sink in. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. They, 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 they carry no weight now. That's, that's beyond secondary to irrelevant. Now that Christ is here, it, nothing is from the outside in. It's from the inside out. His spirit that dwells within us. His, we'll see in, as this con, continues that his spirit will never lead us to do anything we shouldn't be doing. If we lived according to the law of love, that would take care of everything. And we would not need to be afraid or to be in bondage or to uh, struggle needlessly the way we so often do. Verse 7, listen to that. Listen to this. You were running a good race. It's like, what happened, you guys? You were running. You were trusting. You, you were uh, satisfied with the, with the totality of the sacrifice of Christ for your sin. And now you're back to this stuff? Uh, you know, in Acts 15, that was a big part of this. You know, basically in Acts 15, what Paul told Peter was, eat the bacon. You know, <laughs> nothing's unclean. Sin is still wrong, but these, these ceremonial laws, no, 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 no. You were running a good race. And then he says, who cut in on you? Who brought this, this garbage back into your mind? Who... Who's causing you to even consider believing that this might be true? That circumcision does mean something still. No, no. God makes us right with himself, by himself. And all these, these laws that were given again that just show us we're lawbreakers, put them aside. And the law now is the law of love. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? And then he says that kind of persuasion is not from the one who called you. That's not from him. Don't go there. And then he encourages them, is, encourages them to understand based on, a, uh, on a, uh, an Old Testament quote, a, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. If, if, you put, if you put a rotten apple into a bunch of apples that aren't rotten, that rotten apple will bring rottenness to all the other apples. And the same way with a little bunch, a little bit of yeast leavens the whole lump, the whole dough. It gets everywhere and does its thing. And that's why he's saying, watch out for this. Um, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? It, it, what a great question. And what he's saying is, I'm no longer preaching that. It's, it's, that's not the issue anymore. It's Christ is the issue. And then that 12th verse, my, oh my, oh my. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's some pretty serious sarcasm. Of course, he doesn't mean that they would, but the point being that, that that's not going to make any difference either. From circumcision to castration, you don't need to go there and don't do that. Man, he again, he was ticked off. And so the first point, the result of Christ having his way in us is, is the freedom that we have in Christ. He has his way. And it's not about externals. It's all about what's inside. And then the second point, the freedom we have in Christ is maintained as we keep in step with the Spirit. When our kids were little, you can still find it on, on Amazon, I think. It's called Hide Him in Your Heart. There's three, maybe four, uh, Scripture memory verse uh, uh, songs with little devotional thoughts before them. Uh, recorded by a good brother named Steve Green when his kiddos were little. Um, and uh, the, the, the verse on, on uh, keeping in step with the Spirit is uh, set up, it's really creative, with a marching band, you know. Do, 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 do. Boom, 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 boom. You, 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 every person who's in the band needs to kept, keep in step with the music, with the tempo. You need to know where you're going on the field so it doesn't become just a crash of bodies. But... Uh, it, the image of a, of a, of a drum major uh, leading the percussion to establish the rhythm and keep the rhythm and keeping in step with whatever the tempo is, that, that's a great word picture when it says here to keep in step with the Spirit. This is five, Galatians 5, verses 13 through 26. And again, he goes back to this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. He, re he reiterates what he says at the beginning here. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire 
law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That takes care of everything. There'd be no need for the police. There'd be no need for armies or any kind of, of uh, social restraint, you know, any military force. If all of us were loving our neighbors as ourselves, there'd be no need for any of that. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The implication being one or the other is going to be happening. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, whatever your sinful desires are. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. There's no need for the law anymore because the Spirit's never going to lead you to break the law. The Spirit's never going to lead you to do what you shouldn't do. And then he lists these, not, not exhaustive, but exemplary. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he says these things specifically. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and then because it's not an exhaustive list, he says, and the like. I warn you, he says, as I did before, that those who live like this will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this is your lifestyle and you're cool with it and you enjoy doing these things, it's obvious that you're disconnected from God and that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he, he makes the point again, against such things there is no law. Against such things there is no law, because it's not needed. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. And again, the verb tense, not will be, but have crucified the flesh. Positionally, that's taking place. The, the heart's desire, uh, a heart desire of God and for all of us is that experientially it would be our story. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. This whole chapter, again, arguably the most definitive chapter in the Scripture about true freedom and deliverance and the, the joy and the peace, uh, again, the fruit of the Spirit that's listed there, what, what comes when we're being uh, led by God's Spirit, filled with God's Spirit, under the influence of God's Spirit. The same Paul writes in Ephesians, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, I think it's verse 18 in Ephesians 5. Uh, to, under, to understand that, how beautiful that is. I keep saying so many times, I wish simple meant easy, but it is simple. It's that simple. Do the right thing, you won't be doing the wrong thing. And the way to do the right thing is to be embraced by and embracing the right one, who is God himself. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So the second step again is the freedom we have in Christ is maintained as we keep in step with the Spirit. We reject the deeds of the flesh and experience the fruit of the Spirit. And it's, we find that in those verses that we, we just uh, read, we just heard. Galatians 5, 13 through 26. And these final verses begin again with a call to freedom. Uh, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. They, they, they remind us and, and, and tell us that that's what this all about, who is all about. And here's how it happens. Say no to the flesh and yes to the Spirit. Avoid these deeds of darkness, these deeds of the flesh that are enumerated not exhaustively, but specifically starting in verse 19 of Galatians 5. Sexual immorality, impurity, and he goes through uh, uh, this list. And also talks about behaviors of, of just attitude and, and emotions out of, out of control. Uh, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. All those things don't just get you in trouble, they're trouble themselves. And that, that's what we need to understand. Say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit. Because you will choose one over the other 
in some very real ways. If we're not being led by the Spirit, we're being led by the flesh. And and this the question isn't, are you going to choose one of these two? It's which are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to be led by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to trust God to fill you with His Spirit? Or you're continue, are you going to continue to feed that which is bringing destruction to your life by gratifying these dark, sinful desires of your flesh? Again, that bring destruction to everything they touch, to you, to your soul, to other people, to their souls, to society itself, giving in to these things. You give in to them and they take over. That's the battle. So, another way to describe this, uh, where, where he says in verse 16, so I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, is to acknowledge there's a civil war going on inside of every human being, inside of every human heart. And it's not about the north and the south. It's about the spirit and the flesh. The spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit. There's constant contention. And, and that's why we need to choose which way we're going to go. Are we going to go the way of the spirit or the way of the flesh? Because those are the only two choices. And, and, and again, attempting to keep the law is only going to stir the flesh that will ultimately never satisfy and at the end, never be sufficient, ever. We can't make ourselves right with God by trying to behave our way into that. Uh, so, in verse 18 there, it affirms that freedom is real. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You can throw the law book away because the Spirit will only lead you to keep the law, to, to all these logical, loving limits that God puts on our lives about what to do and what not to do. When he tells us what to do, it's because he loves us. When he tells us what not to do, it's because he loves us. These are logical, loving limits that God puts on us, his loved ones, so that we will be able to live in this, navigate the minefield of this fallen world by being led by the Spirit. And then the, the law, again, the law isn't discarded in that sense, but it becomes irrelevant. Jesus came to fulfill it, not to abolish it. And the fulfillment of it in our lives is as we're led by the Spirit, as we keep in step with the Spirit. And it's, you know, one's going to displace the other. Giving into the Spirit is going to displace giving into the flesh. Giving into the flesh is going to displace giving into the Spirit. Again, we, get, we, we, we will choose. It's not that we get to choose. We have to choose because we are going to choose one or the other. Just look back over your life at the choices you made and see where it brought you. And... Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the specific list of the fruit of the Spirit is here. And if you've never memorized it, memorize it, memorize it, especially if you're a believer. Every Christian should know that these, this is the evidence of, of, of the Spirit being in us and us abiding in the vine. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you're the branches. The branches don't produce fruit. The branches bear fruit from the vine. Um, and so... Uh, if 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 a vine is pumping fruit into the branches, the fruit's going to appear there. And the fruit of the spirit is this. This is the evidence of the spirit's presence in a person's life: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And isn't it interesting that the last one listed is self-control? That 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 at times is one of everybody's biggest battles: self-control. So often the, 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 the greatest enemy we have is, as I said before, the man or the woman in the mirror. We, in a, in a heartbeat, we can be our own worst enemy. We can believe things that aren't true. We can do things that aren't right very easily. And that's a big part of why we need him so very much. Again, if you've never memorized Galatians 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, I highly recommend you do that. Also, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. <laughs> Those are, that's an important passage. I want to end by uh, highlighting verse 14. Verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is not always the easiest thing to do. Just ask your neighbor <laughs> about how hard it can be to love their neighbor, you know, you and me. Uh, love, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm old enough to remember when we were a kid living in Mentor, we never locked our house. 
Maybe if we went away for a long, long time, but we never locked it day or night. Because it was just a different time and there wasn't as much lawlessness being expressed as it is now in today's world and rebellion. Oh my, and all the sensuality and the anger. Um, but uh, we never locked our house. It was open to anybody whenever anybody wasn't there. And nobody ever went in. <laughs> yeah. And that that's just such a beautiful thought that if if everybody is loving their neighbor as they love themselves, there'd be no need for locks, alarm systems. As I said before, no need for the police, no need for the military. If everyone on this planet was loving everyone else on this planet, their neighbor as they love themselves, none of all these horrible wars that have gone on and are going on would ever have happened or would not exist if we really loved each other God's way, which, which calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what we want. That's what our heart longs for. And it really does start with us, letting God have his way, Let him, letting him be who he came to be and do what he came to do and give what he came to give. And knowing that, then the law becomes kind of irrelevant. Because, not that it isn't important, but that we'll, 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 we'll be keeping it as we're led by the Spirit, as we're loving our neighbor, as we love ourselves. Really solves everything. And uh, may it become more and more obvious as we as God's children take to heart what he says and understand that this freedom isn't just for me, myself, and I, but that this message of freedom is something that we experience in, in community. Um, and I didn't mention this at, uh, before. In that first verse, it, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He doesn't say you collectively or singularly. He says us. We experience this in community. You can't love your neighbor if there is no neighbor to love, if, if it's just you. And, and so much of, of all that the scripture calls us to is, is predicated upon the, the reality of community. That's how it happens. We're at our best when we're doing life with others. Life is better together. And certainly as it pertains to this real freedom, to being free, to expressing freedom, that that happens best in the community of the family of God then that, by his grace, begins to, like a yeast leavens a lump, to permeate our culture. Don't curse the darkness. Don't, don't be all you know, busted up about how bad things are. That, that's, just how, that's just how it is. But, but be the salt. Be the light that we're called to be. Make, be. Let him make a difference in us so that we can make this difference in the world. And to be people who are led by the Spirit, who love God and love our neighbor. Um, that's how this happens, for sure, for sure, for sure. Here's the making it real questions. How much of your struggle to be free is because you're the one trying to make it happen in your own strength? Again, that first point. The freedom we have in Christ is, is the result of Christ having his way in us, not me having myself in me. Christ having his, ha, me having my way in me. It's Christ having himself in us. So again, how much of your struggle to be free is because you're the one trying to make it happen in your own strength? Just quit. Just resign. Just understand. If you haven't figured it out by now, that's not working. It will never work. Ever. And the second question, what, what expression of the fruit of the Spirit is your greatest need? Which one of those do you struggle with the most? Or, or if more than one is glaringly, man, I, I need God to have his way to make this real in my life. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, all the, all the ones that are lifted there, listed there. And again, self-control probably is at the top of the list for all of us, at least at times. That's, that's, a, that's a biggie, self-control. And the action step is this. Spend some time prayerfully wrestling with your answers to these questions above. Be honest when you answer that first question. Be honest when you answer that second question. And then prayerfully wrestle with your answers and ask God to help you because he he can and he will and and there is this sense where in ans in God answering our prayers our, our the answers to our prayers involve us it's not 
that they they start with us, but they wind up being expressed to us, especially self-control in areas of our lives with, you know, where, where things can be out of control because of the appetites, the lusts of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Um, that that uh, self-control is so important. And I guess me saying it so much is just an expression of the fact that that's one of the things I still struggle with. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a daily, daily thing. Who's going to be who's going to be calling the shots, me or God? Who's in charge? One of the things that came to me years ago is, what do you do with a control freak who's out of control? That was my story. Sometimes still wants to be, but yeah, and be, just prayerfully wrestle with your answers to the to those two questions. And uh, may God have His way as you do that. May God have His way in and through your life and mine. May 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 we all uh, come to see how powerful and beautiful and important this Galatians chapter 5 is. And again, take to heart how ticked off Paul was because, you know, for you to keep trying to pay for something that's been paid for in full, is that's just foolish. Just stop it. Let God have his way. Let God have his way. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we acknowledge your holy name. We are reminded that Jesus instructed us to pray our Father, not my Father. We are family in you. As we look to you in heaven, we ask for your intervention here on earth, that by your Spirit and through your Son, we will press on, knowing the best really is yet to come. Help us keep moving toward people. Please deliver us from wanting and expecting things to always go our way. Strengthen us to be your hands and, and your feet in the world in which we live. We do pray for perspective <clears throat> concerning what's going on in the world these days. Would you give us discernment as we acknowledge so much of the media is furthering an agenda rather than appropriately and responsibly reporting news? Something's changed over the years. Help us see everything in the light of your words to us concerning your unshakable kingdom and our unshaking, unchanging king. And we do pray for your body, the one true church all over the earth. May we as believers in every nation, every language, every tribe, every tongue, may we stand united in the spirit as a living and loving expression of who you are and what you can do. And finally, God, we pray for whoever here today, whoever is among us here, even online, that that one who is really, really struggling and very much wondering if they can even keep going, whoever that person or those ones might be, help them to know that they can keep going and that one day all the answers are going to fall into place even though for now we're not even sure what the questions are supposed to be. For the one or ones who are really, really struggling right now, God, please be their comfort and be their peace. Draw near them and help them to draw near to you. In all of this, God, we pray for your glory and for the good of everyone we know and everyone there is. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good to be together with you again. Always is. And, and trust that it will continue to be, Lord willing, we'll gather again this coming Sunday. And again, we'll keep praying that God has his way. Whatever his will is, is that we'll want that. And by his grace, we'll do that. Here's the benediction as, as we go from this time together. Go now in the true freedom that only Christ can provide and be sure to keep in step with the Spirit, not with your, your flesh or this fallen world. Always take your cue from God and God's Word. Grace and peace.